friends, this is Trish and welcome to Teacher Therapy. Today we have my new friend Gary with us and he is just a store wealth of knowledge. He has been in education for over 20 years. He was in the classroom for 10 years. He's done curriculum writing. He's been a consultant and he's even developing a psychological theory on trauma. So I am super excited to have Gary with us. So we'll just kind of warm up and ask you, what year did you start teaching? What got you interested in teaching and how did you like it once you got in the classroom? So I got started in teaching like in 91 as a substitute. <laughs> and I was actually teaching at the middle school I attended as, as a kid. And I, I became a very um, like popular substitute. Like teachers would request me and I got to know the students. Like I, I knew like 700 names or whatever. And finally, uh, and I can't do that anymore, by the way. <laughs> I don't have that kind of memory. But any, anyway, one day I was teaching a class and I mean, I was really into it. And um, the secretary's principal came by and said, hey, you know, I saw you teaching and I just got to tell you, you this, is your, this should be your career. And honestly, I didn't know what I was going to do for a career. I was kind of uh, just out of college and I had a psychology degree and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And she said, you should you should become a teacher like you. You're naturally good at this. She said most of our substitutes just kind of like babysit, but you actually teach the kids. And I was like, oh. And I honestly, I had never even thought about it. I was just like, I'm just doing this part time now. This is just, you know, to pay some bills. And so I went home, thought about it for a while, called my mother. And I was like, hey, mom, you know, somebody told me I should be a teacher. She's like, you know what? You should be. And I just saw something in the paper uh, for a, uh, a class that's going to start, alternative certification class in Pasadena, Texas. She said, you should check it out. And I did. And that's how it all started. And I became a teacher in Pasadena. And I started in 92. I actually really loved teaching. I was, and I was one of those teachers that worked like in the beginning, 70 and 80 hours a week. I would, I would, I would be there first thing in the morning and I would leave with the cleanup, cleaning crew. <laughs> They'd actually kind of kick me out. Like Mr. Lush, you got to go, dude. Like, you, you know, it's nine o'clock at night or whatever. As much responsibility as we had back then, it is nothing compared to what teachers do now. It's changed so radically. Like it's, so much more pressure. And as much as they piled on us back then, they've taken that and magnified it. I mean, they just don't understand that teachers are not capable of doing every single thing. They don't understand what the word priority means. And they keep telling teachers, these are all your priorities. And I'm like, you realize that when you say everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. The word priority doesn't mean everything. It means a few things, two or three things that you really highly focus on. Right. It's well, it's just... interesting because you started teaching in what a lot of people consider the golden era of teaching. Because all of my veteran teacher friends would say, you know, back in the day, back in the 90s, we didn't have instructional coaches in our room every day. 10 seconds. We didn't have administrators hovering and demanding that we do all of these things. So when you were in the classroom, would you say that you had a lot of instructional freedom to do what you wanted to do? A lot more than a lot more than teachers do now, for sure. Um, and, it, I, and I will say that the golden age was starting to unravel in the 90s, just yeah. just starting to fray. Right. By the time the 2000s rolled around, it was really in free fall. But that's also coincides with the testing craze, which has a lot to do with it. It's not everything. There's there's separate factors. But the the, the testing also just I, mean, I think that put the nail on the coffin right there. Just a, we're so focused on testing. Kids don't do well on tests. Yeah. And kids don't learn from test prepping. And teachers resent it and, and it, bur it burns the teachers out and it burns the students out. And it doesn't actually help them. It doesn't build literacy to test. Prep. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even improve test scores either. So, I mean, I don't understand. You know, it's just an entire system built around preparing for tests rather than teaching the content that you're supposed to teach the kids. Absolutely. Speaking of the kids, what were students like in the 90s? Because I went to school in the 90s and the early 2000s, and I never remember kids acting crazy. <laughs> so what were I'm, your students like? Yeah, I mean, I had like, I mean, I taught predominantly elementary school. I had my share of issues, but normally not anything as egregious as I hear about, like in the news. I mean, a student assaulting me that just i never even thought about that happening the only time i thought about that was i was a high school teacher and i had some pretty rough students there and i knew that i had to like be careful about the kinds of things i might say around them but even then i didn't like on a daily basis think they're going to attack me i don't think they would it was more about like preventing them from fighting each other <laughs> mm -hmm. but but and sometimes students would get in teachers faces but there would there would be repercussions if they like you were not going to just go do that and get away with it. You were going to be removed for a while. 
um, even back then, they, they still struggled with trying to figure out what to do with those kids. But I mean, this, this idea that you would be a fourth grade teacher and some student would just haul off on you and, and, and start beating on you. That was just unheard of, unheard of. You might have heard of that in some cases where there was a severely emotionally disturbed child, you know, but it was a rare thing. It was an outlier. It was not a common occurrence like it is now. And you just, I never had any fear. And I was actually really close to my students and, 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 you know, it was sure they gave me a hard time because that's part of your job as a kid. You got to bust the teacher a little bit. We all did it as kids, but I mean, it was never like exaggerated or, yeah. or the, to the level it is now. I couldn't imagine being fearful that a kid might assault me. That, right. There's there's no way that the teacher should ever have to live in that kind of environment with that kind of emotional drag going, you know, on, on, on them all the time. That's just unheard of, at least in my time. How were the parents? Did you um, find that when you called the parents to let them know how their child behaved, were the parents more supportive during that time period? I would say it's kind of a hit and miss, probably more missed than hit. But I, I taught in a very high poverty area. And I mean, my students had a lot of the same problems that kids have nowadays, which is a, a broken down family structure, right? I mean, also, often the father was not in the home, which is the rotten apple, the the, the core <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. That's eating away our society is we're, we're, we're having we're fatherlessness here. Yeah. People don't want to say that. They're like, oh, that's just a simple. I'm like, no, that's not a simple explanation. That's just the truth. Like you yeah. fix fatherlessness in this country, you will fix most of the other problems. But yeah. until we get that fixed. But anyway, yeah. honestly, a lot of my parents were either working too much or whatever. And it was often difficult. It's often they didn't even have phones. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. It was it was difficult to get parents support. Like it was easier in the in the uh, with the younger kids, like kindergarten, first grade. Mm -hmm. Parents were more involved, and then by the time they got to like fifth grade, which is what I taught, fifth and fourth grade, the parents kind of started stepping back from it. So parental involvement was difficult, but you didn't need it that much. I mean, you did have problems, and and my students were often reluctant learners and so forth. But there wasn't this like adversarial kind of feel that I feel like is going on now. It's, it's almost like this daily kind of grind or conflict between a teacher and a student. I, I didn't have that to deal with. And that would have, that would have knocked me out of teaching within a year or two. <laughs> I, I couldn't have done, I couldn't have done it. I don't even know how teachers do it. Honestly, it, it's so difficult. So it's interesting that you bring up fatherlessness because I actually was trained in an alternative certification route called Teach for America. And I still right. remember to this day, one of the leaders stood up in front of us and he said that, you know, one of the biggest myths that's happening today is that fatherlessness is a bad thing. And he was really angry and passionate about it. And he just kind of went on a rant about how, you know, a single parent home is just as good as a home with two parents. And so yes. it's fascinating to me that so many things that seem so obvious to the average person, like teachers are actively being indoctrinated not to, you know, uphold having a father in the home, not to uphold the family. And so, and I'm wow. imagining in the nineties, you did not see that at all. No, I mean, we all knew that was a big problem and and statistics completely bear that out and there's no way he would have an empirical background to back up what he's saying it is quite obvious from the data that children from um dual parent homes do better than single and it's not a knock on single parenthood it's not a like a um i'm not attacking single mothers what I am saying is that is that they tend to have less stable homes. And even when they do have stable homes, because they have to work so much, they, they have difficulty being there for their child. They don't, they're, they're, um, they're over leveraged. They have too much to do. It's not a knock on them. It's just as much a knock on the father because where the hell is he? Why aren't you stepping up and being a man? That's what being a man is. A man is taking care of your wife and children, right? And <laughs> this idea that somehow we're going to glorify it, we shouldn't glorify it. We shouldn't condemn it. We shouldn't judge it. We shouldn't moralize women about that kind of thing. But we shouldn't glorify it either. It's There's nothing to glorify about it. It's a harder road. I come from a divorce home. Divorce homes are not the best place either. Mm -hmm. it, you know, a, a, and, and it's, it's not a, as if there's some perfect ideal home. I'm not saying that. I'm saying in general. A two-parent home tends to do a better job than single parents. And single parents tend to struggle more. They just have less resources. Definitely. I, 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 
the fact that that's even controversial is mind blowing to me. Um, Same. <laughs> and, I, and I give kudos to single parents. It's a tough road. I wouldn't want to do it. Um, and I give them kudos for doing it. And we need to support them in every way that we can because they have a really difficult job. But we shouldn't also say it doesn't matter. I mean, right. that's, that's, that's crazy. I don't know what else to say about that. I'm with you on that one. And that kind of ties into the conversation that we've been having across the channel about kids that are going through trauma. You know, maybe they have a single parent home. Maybe they don't have a lot of positive influences and they're hurting and they're in pain and they're acting out. And the big modern question has been, you know, how should somebody deal with this? What should we do? And so I've kind of talked a little bit about how there's a lot of pressure from, you know, the ed talk world to let students melt down, let them curse, let them say what they want, let them express their feelings and to just understand that they're having trauma and where they're coming from and not really have, you know, consequences that are punitive, that we just kind of need to make space for their emotions and be understanding. And my reply has been, and no, we really need to teach students how to manage their emotions, how to be productive citizens, how to have coping strategies so that they can actually be successful in the real world. And so you had uh, mentioned to me in your email that you're coming up with a psychological theory about this whole topic of trauma. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think like the, the prevailing philosophy in um, psychology and in, in education is sort of a mix of a couple different things. Part of it is um, postmodernism and postmodernism is very subjective. And I'm not saying it's all about emotions, but, but it is very subjective. And it says your subjective perception is the most important thing. And I get that, like experientially, that is true. However, there's limitations to everything. And, and, and part of the problem we have is we take everything in the United States and then we take it to an extreme. True. Just, just got to push the boundaries, like to the point that you just know that there's no common sense left anymore, right? Why do we have to take everything to such extreme? So what they do is they take that sort of this postmodernist view and then this sort of romanticism view, which is also very subjective. And it's all about how you experience the world. So that's the only thing that matters is how you experience it. And the thing is, there have always been kids from trauma. You have trauma in your background. I have trauma in my background. I have friends that have more trauma than I have, right? Like I probably, my trauma is probably fairly moderate in comparison to other people's traumas. But your trauma is not a license to bleed all over everyone else. And we're teaching kids that's what you can do. You can use your trauma to justify any behavior that you want. And what we need to teach kids is how to self-regulate. There is no service being done to children by teaching them that being emotionally labile and just going off is a good thing. Not for them, not for their family, not for their classmates, not for their teacher, and definitely not for society. Okay, because what, what there's three things going on. Kids are over-identifying with trauma. It's become like a concept or an idea that we're just going to, Oh, I'm traumatized and therefore I can do whatever I, I, I want I want to do. And I say this from working with kids that are my son's age. Okay, I have a 22 year old son and I've met some of his friends. And boy, some of these kids in this in this generation are lost, Trish. They are. I look in their eyes. I can see. And, and most of the ones that are lost, guess what? They don't have didn't have growing up. Yes. They either didn't have a father, or their father was abusive, either emotionally, physically, or both. They truly have been traumatized, but they also act in a way that that communicates this idea that I'm so traumatized, I can act in ways that are inappropriate. And they have, and I've called them on it. And they just go off on me saying they don't understand, I don't understand their trauma. I'm like, it doesn't work that way. Like in the adult world, you're not five years old. You don't get screamed till you get your way anymore. You have to learn how to cope and you have to learn to see things from other people's points of view. The whole, the whole thing is inherently narcissistic, completely narcissistic. We are, we are raising a generation of completely self-absorbed kids. They're good kids. I'm not putting them down. They're good kids and they're bright kids, but I mean, they're a product of the system that we're creating. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, so it's really not on them. It's on the people in charge. Right. The older adults, including the school system. So they over identify with this this idea because it's saturated in the media. Then they operationalize it. They think like, oh, how can I use this to get my way? Because, well, gee, shocker, kids will try to get their way. Oh, my gosh. What a revelation. And you mean they're not pure and saintly inside? <laughs> no. Do you remember yourself in middle school or not? Oh, my gosh. Of course not. 
they're, they're, they're little beasts sometimes, right? Like, I mean, I was a little, I was a good kid overall, but I had my moments, right? And if, and if I was ever in a system that would allow me to sort of operationalize this idea of trauma in order to get my way, you don't think I would have done it? I would have done it. Mm -hmm. I know I would have done it. And then um, the third thing is they project it on other people. So there's just a projection of trauma everywhere until they're just mired in this sense or this concept of trauma. And they live out their life in accordance with it. And really what they're doing is re-traumatizing themselves and others mm -hmm. in the process. That's the irony behind it, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, oh, I'm so traumatized that I'm going to act in ways that traumatize other people or cause them problems at the very least. And we're sort of stuck in this system. And and I want I want kids to get help for their trauma. But part of the help is what you pointed out. We learn we need to learn to self-regulate. And you can't be abusive and disruptive and manipulative. And then blame that on your mom and dad or whoever. It's not a badge for bad behavior. And I think that's what's happened. I think it's become a badge or excuse for, for bad behavior. And and we told them, it's okay. Yeah, it, it, it is. It will reward you for it. We'll reinforce, because every time they do that stuff that you're talking about, Trish, they're reinforcing that behavior. Like from a behavioral perspective, they're just, this is Skinnerian. I mean, oh, you, you had a tantrum and you got your way and you got to do this. Okay, well, we're going to give you this. Oh, and the kid thinks, Oh, well, I'll just do more of that then. Mm -hmm. And it's really not the kid's fault. They're responding to the system that they're in. That's the set of expectations that they're in. But it is a disaster that we're cooking up here because how are those kids going to make it on the outside? I'm sad because I don't think they realize what they're actually doing to these kids. They're perpetuating their trauma. They're perpetuating their, their inadequacies. None of what they're doing, for the most part, is helping those kids, in my opinion. I, I think they're actually doing these really extreme systems is actually setting kids up for failure later on because they never learn how to self-regulate. Right. No, I totally agree. I still remember professional development and I'm wondering if I should say the name of this book, but there was a semi-famous author with the semi-famous book that came and did a professional development for the teachers. And the premise behind this woman's book was that we have criminalized black girls and our desire for them to show respect and to not <laughs> show defiance was actually internalized racism. And the idea was that if black girls are cursing and you know just really being aggressive, that that is a part of their culture. And we just need to understand and we just need to be flexible. And as How a is that not woman, a racist statement right there? Exactly, as a black woman, I was extremely offended by this because it just seems like whether it's for traumatized populations, impoverished populations, you know, people of color, it just seems like they're saying, what is like the lowest possible standards that we could have? <laughs> and let's go ahead, like you said, and typecast these people and set them in a mold for the rest of their lives by not giving them skills that are needed to function in the rest of society. And so I just remembered so many instances with various professional developments where I was just dumbfounded um, about how people couldn't see through this. But I think the truth is a lot of people are afraid to speak out because they know it, A, it's not gonna go anywhere, it's kind of pointless, but you know, there's not really room for a discussion. And so when you were operating more, would you say that the curriculum department is more administrative, like the administrative side of things? Well, like as a content writer, you weren't administrative. Okay, that's what I thought. Did yeah. you see a lot of those conversations brewing in the background or how did that work in Texas? So when I was actually writing curriculum, those conversations never came up. Like, like it might have been like in the wind a little bit starting back then, but we wrote content. I mean, it was focused on, you know, I wrote language arts content. So it was focused on learning language arts, content, reading and writing. Um, speaking, listening skills, those kinds of things. I was not focused. And, and I focused on broader, like philosophical themes for kids too, mm -hmm. to, to, to engage them. Big ideas and those kinds of things, you know, essential questions. There, there wasn't, it, there wasn't this, what's the word for it? This sort of um, cultural haze around, around everything. Um, everything's become sort of re reduced to that now. And I, I don't, I think they take it to an extreme. I do think that, that we can acknowledge, you know, that we've had a, a system in place that has not always served people of color. Okay. I, I think we can all freaking acknowledge that, right? Like that's, <laughs> we know that that's true, but have we taken it too far in, in our response and, and in taking it too far, are we hurting the very people we claim to be helping? And I, to your point, 
I think we are. I, I don't think you want black girls over identifying with that sort of phenomenon. Like, why would you want them to identify with that? Why can't they identify with the fact that I'm an individual and I'm in control of who I am and where I can go in life, regardless of where I come from. I'd rather my kids, I never taught my kids to look at themselves as victims. And I think this sort of victimology that's going on now is very, very dangerous, like extreme. And it's the most dangerous to the very people that they say they're trying to help. Right. You, you're disempowering children by, by, by doing that. Now, it's hard for me to even say these things because I feel like I'm going to be called certain words for this. But I kind of live in the fear of, oh, I'm going to be called racist if I say these things, even though I'm saying those things because I don't want them to end up hurting the very kids that, that they're supposedly trying to help. Because as to your point, they're over identifying with these things. They're teaching these ki- these things to kids and then they're reinforcing them. The kids incorporate them into their personalities. Like, oh yeah, I am this, I am this, I am that. No, you're not. Well, it's kind of funny because even as like a black woman, I was told that I was identifying with the oppressor or that I have internalized whiteness or that I was culturally white, even though I'm a black woman. And I was told this by somebody else that was black from a different professional development. And it was like a a kind of a one-on-one conversation off to the side. So thankfully she didn't like tell me this, you know, that I'm like a white oppressor from the stage or anything. But it's one of those things that if you don't go along with the narrative that you're automatically basically called a white supremacist. And one thing that made me sad that I thought of when you were talking is I'm like a huge fan of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. So I raised over a thousand dollars to get a class set of, you know, all seven novels for each and every student. And the kids were absolutely loving it. And I was actually told, you know what, C.S. Lewis is an old dead white man. You need to not use that anymore. And you just need to find some like little picture books with black kids in it. And so it just, it, it boggles the mind. It, everything well, is so out of control. Well, because it's it, it's operating from such a, a, a some such ignorance. And here's what I mean by that. Okay, so I would go into schools and try to introduce literature, like predominantly black schools, and try to introduce literature where, because all they were doing was test prep packets. <laughs> like canned passages. And I was like, and they're like, well, we need to be culturally relevant. I said, 100%. Here's some James Baldwin. But they but they wouldn't read that either. And then, and then they were like, well, we could read this, but, you know, I don't want to do Shakespeare. I said, do you know who influenced James Baldwin? Do you know that James Baldwin was influenced by Shakespeare? Uh, by Shakespeare? He was a big Shakespeare person. It, it, you can see it in his writing. No. <laughs> Black kids should read Shakespeare just like a white kid should read Baldwin. Right. Just like a white kid should hear jazz and a black child should be exposed to classical music. See what I'm saying? Like, 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 I don't, I don't understand like why you want to like culturally, what's the word, narrow things down for kids. We should get a broad variety of writers, some of them who are from your culture and others who are not. But this kind of this idea that um, if it's not exactly from their culture, it's not worthy, even if that writer is a fantastic writer. So, you know, they were shocked when I, when I told them, I said, yeah, Baldwin was very influenced by by, by Shakespeare. I know prof- black professors who teach Shakespeare, right? right? And <laughs> are they, or would they be guilty of incorporating? That's what they would probably say. They I say don't know. Bad that they have internalized racism and whiteness. So <laughs> I wanted to ask you, because I know you mentioned in the email that you were actually asked to leave from a contract for just kind of calling attention to ineffective reading practices and curriculum. Can you tell us a little bit more of like the juicy stuff? <laughs> that goes on kind of behind closed doors with like curriculum arguments and trying to get, you know, schools on the right track and the pushback and just anything about that you want to say. So, so here's what's going on. Like, <clears throat> and this is what's really damaging kids at a younger age here is in the elementary schools across the country. And I won't name these curriculums, but you can probably figure them out. There's two sets of curriculums that are, that have been ad- widely adopted. Neither one has been truly vetted or, or studied in a way to, to validate them as, as being effective. They're, they're based on this premise that you should read, kids should only read at whatever level they're on. So if I have a third grade student, but they're reading on a first grade level, they should read first grade book, but they should do third grade work. What I've tried to tell teachers is the minute you, you've shifted your text down two or three grade levels, you're doing that grade level work. Sorry, I don't care what standards you throw at them. That's coming from me who made his living writing standards, using standards to create curricular documents. I don't care what standard it is. If you're using a, a low-level text, you, then you're, 
you're, you're functioning at the grade level of that text. So what happens is kids get stuck. I'm forever reading first grade and I don't progress. The other side of that is they don't ever learn a systematic approach to phonics, to decoding text. So they don't have the, the automatic automaticity that you get through decoding skills and they're reading at a constantly at a lower level you don't get better you know you don't get better you don't improve by doing things on your level you get better by doing things a little bit above your level that's what zpd is about you know it's like okay i'm here well i don't need to read down here i need to read just above i mean i can't read up here because that's too, too much of a jump but i need to read here like you want to get better at anything like basketball or 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 crocheting i don't care Go, go do that with people that know how to do it better than you and you'll get better, right? So it's the same thing with a text. You need to do, you need to read text that challenge you. Well, these systems have neither systematic phonics and tell the kids to read on their own level. So at the end of the year, the kid has moved up, what, a half a grade level, maybe? And so they get to high school and they're reading on a fifth grade level if they're lucky. Yeah. So th these curriculums have been, and, 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 and it's these really nonsense things like every, everybody can just read whatever they want to read. And I'm, I've always made this point. How do I know they understood that text if I've not read it? If I've got 25 kids and they're all reading different texts, how do I know all 25 understood their different texts? You can just ask, how? I said, you need to read all 25 of those texts. No, I've, I mean, I've actually had colleagues tell me, no, you don't. I'm like, you're insane. You, of course you do. I'm all for choice. You can have some choice, but the teacher needs to be able to know where that kid is on that on that text. And that text needs to be challenging. It needs to have rich vocabulary. It needs to have complex sentence structure and syntax. It has none of that. They're, they're, those texts are often banal. They, they're, they're, they're weak. And you don't get good at reading when you read weak text. And we have two curriculums out there that are based on those things. They don't have systematic phonics. The kids are reading below grade level text. The, the, the curriculum is not sequenced in a manner to, that's gonna build skills. There's a lack of content knowledge building because you need content knowledge so you have background knowledge to it. attach, right? So when you read, you understand. Those systems are in like 70% of our elementary schools. Wow. When I discovered that one of those systems was in place at the school and the teachers were just telling me, I don't know what to do with this. Like it's not working with my kids. I started making adjustments to it, trying to work around. I had planned to do some long range planning with them. Well, it got back that I was going to do that. And I understood my what my employer was saying. Um, my employer was concerned because, you know, the district had spent a lot of money and I get that, but I wasn't going to throw out the entire system. I was going to make, okay, some significant adjustments. But my bigger point would be like, is it about how we spend money or is it about what we're giving kids? Because if we're giving them the wrong thing, they're going to be unsuccessful. So we've got 70% of American elementary schools using one of these two systems. So what we have is a, a, a broad basis of illiteracy. <laughs> those, those systems are not good for a lot of kids. They're especially really bad for kids from poverty. Mm -hmm. because the kids that come from middle class and upper middle class homes tend to have more enrichment and background knowledge built in to their experiences, right? And so so they bring more schema into things that so helps them read better. Kids from poverty don't have that. It's not a moral judgment. It's just a right. yeah. observation. And so when you give them a, a curriculum that doesn't have those things built into it, they don't develop. Right. And so you end up with kids that know very little, and can, can't really read very well. Yeah, you just right. described my whole battle that I went through with, you know, I taught fourth through eighth grade English language arts. And I remember specifically, you know, with the class at novels, you know, they were rigorous. We had so many great vocabulary enrichment practices. A lot of the things since, you know, the books were kind of written in the 50s, there was a lot of things that they had to look up and learn and understand. And it was so great. But I was told exactly what you said that, oh, those books are too hard for the kids oh, they need to have, you know, book choice because kids will never learn to read if they don't have book choice. And even if the kid wanted to read, you know, Diary of a Wimpy Kid or something, you know, all day or Captain Underpants or whatever, they're like, you have you to, go. you know, let them read these baby books. And it just, it was so frustrating because I could see the gains and the growth that I was getting with doing things the way, you know, we've always done them. Teachers have always had class sets of novels that the whole class went through. You know, the teacher could assign vocabulary from it. The teacher could call kids up and have conversations with the student and see if they're understanding. But just, it seems like all of these just basic practices that everybody has always done. We're now being told, oh no, you can't do whole class novels. You've got to let the kid read, you know, 
whatever they want to read. And it has to be like on their level and all of these different things. And it's not a wonder that the reading scores are as bad as they are. <laughs> it's almost um, like you stepped into a parallel universe because you're like, so wait a minute, you want me to stop doing the things that actually work? And continue doing these things that don't work. Is that, let me just get that. Can I, can I get that in writing in that exact verbiage? Can you write that down for me? Stop doing what's actually works and start and continue to do what doesn't work and is actually damaging students in the long run. And the kids don't know any better. Right, they, just yeah. know, they just know, oh, and, and, and look, me as a kid, I was in, kind of inherently lazy. So if you gave me a, a system where I could like get away with stuff like that, oh, I would have done it. I would have done it, you know? To my detriment. And the thing is, you know, we all learned those systems. And I'm not saying those systems were perfect. Far from it. There's some things that I do believe in student choice and things like that to a degree. There's limitations to everything. You know, if we if we just wouldn't take everything to such extremes, some of these things might actually be helpful, right? But we don't. We we always have to like blow them up beyond all reason and then they don't work at all. But yeah, those those practices, they're just so damaging. And and I don't know why they don't see it. It's like this collective the shared illusion that they've put themselves in and then you add on all the cultural stuff and people are afraid to speak out against it it's it it creates a like a academic silence people aren't allowed to to voice their opinion and that makes everybody that makes um group think that perpetuates it right Mm -hmm. since since i can't say anything i just i either have to go along and be quiet or i have to join in and become part of it that's pretty much your choice or get out which a lot of teachers are now they're 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 getting out. But think about this, Trish, all these kids that are being raised in the system, some of them are going to become teachers. And then think about the mindset they're going to bring to the classroom. Terrifying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. That's the scary part to me is that they're going to now become educators. Yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah. I still remember one school that I transferred to. And when I started at this school district, I said, what's in place, you know, for your English and reading curriculum, they had absolutely nothing. <laughs> so I was like, hey, that means that I can, you know, do what I know works. And so for the first several months of school, you know, we made it through already first few months of school we had gone through multiple novels the kids on their you know second diagnostic testing had jumped up majorly i want to say i had one of the highest jumps in all of the school district with this particular group of kids and sometime after christmas they decided okay nix whatever you were doing you know stop it with all the whole class novels and the big thing that they wanted to do is basically this model where a teacher stands in front of the classroom and this was fifth grade at the time and read to them out of like a picture book, like a baby book, and then, you know, did some kind of like mini lesson on chart paper. And that was supposed to be the thing. And That's I'm like, the system I'm talking reading. about. Yeah, they're yeah, literally they're... listening to me read. How is this going to happen? I know, I know. And that was one of my criticisms of this system is that there was a lot of teacher reading out of a little book and talking and then the kids like really not go- knowing what's going on and you know floor time and all this kind of nonsense yes. <laughs> yeah i know it's a, and and here's the crazy thing is you made those jumps right you got those jumps with your kids you you improved in any rational world they would have looked at you and said hey trish what are you doing in there so that we can replicate that oh you're doing common sense <laughs> <laughs> like It boggles my mind. Like, how can we do that? How can we look at what a teacher is doing? Look at the results they're getting. Dismiss those results and then give them something to do that doesn't work. Yeah. And I found, too, it seems like in a lot of kind of low income districts, there's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of shifts in administration. And there's a lot of let's jump on the bandwagon of something somebody in Idaho is doing that has like, you know, a multi-million dollar budget. That program those people are using can magically be transported here and it's going to work. And that's just the mindset I've seen so much, just like this trend hopping. And it's so crazy to the point where literally the things that they said in professional development last year was bad for student learning. Now it's what we're doing this year. And nobody ever addresses the fact that you just told us last year that that was, you know, an ineffective instructional strategy. And so it it really makes you wonder, like, what's going on with, with these administrators? I know that there's a lot of money involved. And I think I don't even understand it. I think so much of it is optics based because they can say we implemented, you know, this researched instructional strategy. And when it doesn't work, because inevitably it won't work, they can just blame it on the teachers and say, oh, you know, ineffective teachers. They couldn't do miracles. Right. Instead Instead of looking at the curriculum, because the research shows 
the number one influential factor is actually curriculum, then instruction, because good instruction is built on good curriculum. You have a faulty curriculum, no matter how good instruction is, yeah. it'll, it, it won't translate very well. Curriculum is the backbone of a school or, or district. And by the way, this is something to say, say, show me the research, because I started doing very intense research on this. Like I read and read and read. And here's what I found out. There was no research based on it. It was not based on research at all. The, or the research that it was based on was like a graduate student's dissertation. So it was never vetted, right? It was never really examined. And so all of these assumptions that it had validity and reliability and all this were erroneous. So we're, we're, we're when you ask people to show them, show you, please show me, show me this and show me third party. Don't just show me the company, the publishing company. <laughs> They'll do that. They'll run their own research. I don't trust that. No, you show me peer reviewed, independently peer reviewed. There is no independently peer reviewed articles for these systems I'm talking about, at least for one of them. It was based off of a curriculum, off of a dissertation, and it was never fully tested to see if it was valid. And everybody ran with it. It's like a contagion. And then everybody started buying it. And then, oh, well, they're doing that over there. They're doing that over there. Well, we should be doing that too. And the system doesn't work. It's not a good system at all. Um, you know how kids learn to read, right? Like you read a lot. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I've been trying to say. Yes. <laughs> the number one thing that makes a kid a good reader is the act the action of reading. They should read voluminously yes. and they should read either on or above grade level text. Yes. <laughs> on or yeah. above grade level, not below grade level. I and mean, you might want to start off the year that way and then build them up, but, but you need to get going. You need, to, you know, now I know that we get to the point of like, Oh, but I'm in seventh grade and they're in a third grade level. Okay. But that's because we're using this stupid system right. that, that doesn't, when are we going to get rid of that system that doesn't work? Cause it's, Districts spend thousands and millions of dollars on this stuff. And then, like you said, it doesn't work. And they're like, you know what? The teachers aren't implementing it correctly. Mm -hmm. And then they Which, change it just the next year. And right. yeah, it's so crazy because back to like the optics, that is what annoyed me so much about being an English language arts teacher is I felt like when people walked in, they wanted to see me doing like backflips with like fiery batons. And I'm like, the kids are not doing the work that's actually going to strengthen their mind. And that's going to make them proficient readers. And it was like the kids were already allergic to hard work. And so I allergic to hard work. Yeah, I was like, I don't understand like how me standing up here talking with like my little anchor charts and me reading random little stories to them, like that's not going to translate to them being better readers. They have to read. It's got to be rigorous. They have to produce work based upon what they read. All of these traditional old fashioned things that coincidentally, like they worked and we could all read. But now with all of these weird little things, our little iPad programs and different things, it's just, I really fear it's only going to get a lot worse. It's yeah. getting worse, right? I mean, right. you have you have friends that are educators. I mean, I've sort of disconnected myself over the past couple of years because I'm not in that world anymore. So I keep up with it, you know, through like YouTube, your channel and, and, and reading and stuff, but I don't talk to teachers the way I used to. I used to be in schools all the time. So I'm not, and I know that like after uh, COVID and the, in the closures, things got significantly worse. Like everything got amplified or magnified that was going on before. And now, now things are at a, I mean, the way I understand it, they can't keep teachers in the classroom anymore. Like they're, they're quitting in droves. There's so many quitting videos online. I was like, oh my gosh. That's yeah. scary because who's going to teach kids? I mean, we're going to have this shortage to the point that we won't be able to actually have a viable system anymore. You mentioned when you were writing that you worked with students in the prison population and you saw some attitudes and mindsets that affected them. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? You know, that's a group of kids that truly really were traumatized. Like you could see it. And, um, but at the same time, there were, there was a lack of awareness on a lot of those kids of their of how their own behaviors got them to where they are, right? Like you can say, you can acknowledge, I was born into this really bad situation. But at some point, you as an individual have to be able to find the strength to be able to say, okay, but that's not my destiny. I can be a different person. Now those kids just lack a lot of role models. I mean, it's just, it's it's rough because a lot of those kids told me, you know, I don't have a dad. Um, I, I can I, I can think of maybe a handful of kids that I met in the in the prison school system that actually had fathers in their lives. And some of them didn't have mothers either. Like they were just bouncing all around. These were really, you know, hard luck stories in a lot of ways. My other impression was they were trying to teach these kids the same kind of basic stuff that kids on the outside would get, mm. you know, your biology, your algebra, that kind of stuff. I'm like, you know, I don't think that's what those kids need at this juncture. 
what those kids need is a way to make money. So legally, <laughs> so they can actually function and they don't resort to slinging drugs or doing something else illegal. Right. Because those kids were doing those things illegally, mostly out of survival. Yeah. That's how, I mean, that's just the truth. They were doing, you know, they were stealing or, or selling drugs because that's what they saw. But that's also the way that they could make some money to live and eat and function. So why aren't we putting those kids into more like um, practical type of situations that like col an accelerated culinary program or an accelerated um, uh auto mechanics, anything like that, that would teach them a trade that within a year or two, they could get out welding, whatever it may be, and start making some money. I also think we should offer continuing education for those kids so that if they say, you know what, I like doing this, but I want more and I want to go back. Okay. We're going to help you go to, to community college or even to a four-year college. We're going to help you do that too. But you've got to get their foot in the door first, right? And their foot in the door is not teaching them all the basic stuff because they were zero interested in learning. I mean, like they were disaffected. It was, it was bad. They had, it, it was very hard to get them to be engaged because their minds elsewhere, yeah. you know? And I just think, I don't think we're taking the practical approach for those kids. And a lot of people would say, oh, are you saying those kids are not smart? <laughs> this is where you, what you're saying is those kids aren't smart enough to learn academic stuff. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that their situation calls for a different measure that will help them escape their poverty cycle so that they can then make better informed decisions about what they want to do with their future. That's what I'm saying. I totally agree, by the way. I totally and, agree. And by the way, what, why is it that you feel it's less valuable to do plumbing or electrician's work than it is to be a lawyer or a doctor or some kind of white collar? Why, why is that? Or an accountant? Why do you, why do you presume? I mean, you're, they're the ones actually presuming that that's a lower level. I'm not. I'm just presuming that's a way of, for them to get out of poverty. But yeah. those were some, that, those were really some sad days for me. I would come home depressed because mm. those that's kids were just so lost. They were, they were 16 and some of them were really hardened already. Like, mm. It's just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you want you, you want to feel depressed. You go into these schools that are, that house these kids or prisons, but there's schools within the prison, right? And it's gray and drab, and oh, it's so dis it's so disheartening. I, I I I did that for two years, probably about thirty times. I went there, mm. and over the course of two years, and every time I came home, I was just depressed. Mm. And yeah, I I don't know how teachers do that full time. Oh yeah, I couldn't. <laughs> no, not at all. So. Let's see if we can find any bright spots. Is there anything that's happening in education that you've seen within the last decade that you actually feel like it's a good change from how things used to be? I mean, I do think that that a lot of the things that I've I sort of, I don't know, uh, criticize, I guess, or actually have a positive side to them. It's just, again, what I've, what I've said and what I continue to say is that we've taken them to an extreme that mm -hmm. makes them ridiculous. But like, you know, this idea of, of trauma, I think that's an important thing. I think we need to have discussions about about that. And I think we need to get kids help for their trauma. We, we're woefully understaffed in schools and kids, I think, have pushed that us to, to start addressing mental health. And I think that's a good thing. I, I do think there's a place for some student choice in there. I do think that also that, um, you know, this idea that we're, we're going to focus more on what's best for kids rather than what's just expedient for teachers is not necessarily a terrible thing. All of those are good things. I think kids are more emotionally aware nowadays than, than we were. Those are all potentially bright spots. The question is, what are we doing with those things? And, and, and you know, how, how are we managing them or addressing them? Or I think we're kind of warping them, honestly. Yeah. And that's the problem. It's not, it's, it's never so much a matter of what we're doing, but the degree to which we're, we're doing. I mean, I think most teachers would be agreeable that there's merit in a lot of those things. And when you do them to an extreme, when you do them in a thoughtless sort of manner in a manner that is counterproductive to teachers and to students and to ultimately to society when you start doing them that manner well then then we need to stop and have a discussion about whether this is the best thing or not like we might have to back up and and reconfigure how we going to go forward because my whole thing is like okay forget the philosophical arguments what do you see happening in front of you right now is 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 the dynamic that dynamics that you see unfolding right now are these good dynamics i don't think they're good dynamics i think i think i think i really worry about this generation you know and i don't want to i don't want to come across like the old curmudgeon all right this generation you know it is but it's not that i just see them they're they're so wrought by so much that's going on they're so overwhelmed 
emotionally and psychologically. And I don't think they have a good footing to go forward in life. I mean, I come from an, the Generation X and, um, you know, we were kind of put through the grist mill. Like uh, we just, you know, you kind of had just had to function and you just kind of had to make it on your own. And um, <laughs> I couldn't imagine bringing up all this emotional stuff when I was a kid. Like they would have looked you like, I think I think I would have gotten beaten up more for it or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and I'm not saying that's a good thing either. I'm just saying like we were we were tougher back then. And I do think we need to teach kids to be a little bit tougher inside. You you don't need to. You absolutely do not need to be triggered by every single thing that happens to you. And like you can actually choose to keep your calm and to ignore some things because being triggered is not a is not a um, mark of you being emotionally aware all the time. Being constantly triggered is, is a mark of, it's an indication that you can't self-regulate. <laughs> yes. And if you can't self-regulate, so we have two major problems. You already have an attachment problem because kids have told you about the father of this, follow this list. Oh my gosh. The lack of fathers in homes and the breakdown of the family. So that causes what we call attachment issues. And you add on top of that, this sort of this emotional turmoil that kids are embroiled in constantly. And, and where does that leave a kid? So I don't have an attachment and, or I, I have a faulty attachment or not a full attachment. I have issues with attachment. And now I have issues with um, self-regulation. Those are the cornerstones of psychological health, right? You have to have a, you, you come from a, a family where you had a, a strong attachment, mom, dad, both hopefully, and you learned how to self-regulate, control your impulses and emotions, delay gratification. Those are all things that make you a functional adult later on. And those are all the things we're taking away from kids. And we're institutionalizing it through a school system, which is really scary to me. Like that's, that's just, and, and teachers are doing it unknowingly, in my opinion. I don't think they fully realize what what's going on in, in the impact. And I'm not castigating teachers at all. I mean, honestly, it's teachers have such little say so now, you know, Definitely. and I had a lot more room for creativity when I was a teacher. I was left to do what I thought was right for the most part. I mean, I had a curriculum and I followed it. But so they, they trusted you. <laughs> they did trust me. They did. They did. They generally did trust us as long as, you know, I mean, they looked at our scores and stuff, but, but there was not this. There's such a like a oppositional kind of dynamic going on between teachers and administration. I, I'm sure it's always been somewhat that. To now it's just what's the word for it? bananas? I don't know. It's crazy. It's crazy because they're 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 butting heads constantly. And I don't really feel like teachers' voices are heard often when they say I can't do all of this, and then the administrators say you have to. I'm like, did you not just hear me? I literally cannot do everything you just asked me to do. Yeah. I, I, and how do we go forward from that, Trish? Like, how do you, how do you advance beyond that? When I've just told you what you're asking of me is impossible. And then your response is you have, I either have to find a way to do it, or you're going to guilt me by saying, don't you care about the children? Or like, worse, I, that you can't be a teacher at the school anymore. In worst case scenario. How do they, how can they even have that gall when they know that it's hard to find teachers actually to replace? When it gets to that point, what are they going to do? Where they literally cannot find somebody to take their place. What are they going to tell that teacher then? Yeah, we got to the point in certain buildings that subs didn't even want to come. <laughs> so literally us teachers, we had to cover our colleagues, you know, absences during our plan time because subs wouldn't even come to the school. And somehow teachers even got blamed for that. We were told if you guys were friendlier to the subs, then maybe we'd have more subs that would want to come to the school. So I just saw like every issue. So you were blamed for the subs too? Yes. Every issue possible would be blamed on teachers, formally and publicly. It was crazy. Oh and not God. every not every administration was like terrible, but a lot of the upper, upper, like district level administration, like that is where I had a lot of my beef because I knew that they were the ones kind of behind the scenes making our, you know, principals say what they were saying and do what they were doing. Because honestly, a lot of my administrators looked completely beaten down. And a lot of them even got like severely sick. And I had one administrator two years in a row that had to leave for like three months at a time, like doctor's orders, because they were getting so sick under the stress and pressure. So like you were saying, it's just, it seems like it's a collapsing, you know, system that cannot be sustained. And even at least in the districts that I was a part of, even the superintendents would barely last three years. It was usually anywhere between one and three years, and then there'd be a new superintendent. So it just seems like a really unsustainable system. Um, and I think it's because like at the very heart and at the very core, people can't agree on what their values are. <laughs> 
old fashioned values like hard work, kindness, respect, following rules, like that made institutions work in the past. But now that people are trying to light all those things on fire and we're going to, you know, professional developments that says, oh, if your student calls you, you know, the B word, she's just expressing her culture. And we're told like, oh, you can't have the students actually do work. You need to be reading at the front from baby books and just all the like mayhem and craziness. It's just, it's a zoo and it's like our job's impossible yet we're held accountable for these kids' test scores. Right. And I've mentioned other other videos, there's like an epidemic of teachers cheating and just making up scores because we're put in such an impossible situation that literally is impossible. And our jobs are a lot of times tied to our test score. So I know a lot of teachers that would just flat out make up test scores. And oh I believe gosh. the administration knew that, but they were fine with that because then from the superintendent district office, that school looked like it was doing better because everyone's passing their benchmark. Oh my so it's all an illusion. Yeah, that's exactly wow. the emperor's new clothes. It's just a complete farce. It's a total game. And people that try to kind of like pop holes, you know, they don't last very long. So that's what oh I've been God. seeing the last, you know, several years. I, I, I had heard some things about cheating, but I didn't realize it was like you know, a widespread problem. Sorry about that. And yeah. So essentially a lot of the schools that I worked at switched from traditional grades to something called standards based grading. And so essentially that means that every so-called grade was based on something called benchmark test. And so we would um, have the test created for us. Sometimes teachers would take part in creating these little tests. And basically you could get like a little letter, like um, M would be meeting, W would be working towards and N might might be, you know, needs improvement or not meeting the standard. And so essentially like these little like kind of tests made up everything. And so we were in charge of administering them and we would just enter them into a spreadsheet. And then the kids were often able to retake these same exact test again. And so essentially <laughs> it was nothing to just say, oh, this kid got, you know, uh, he went from an N to a W, you know, so that shows, oh, 40% growth. Because <laughs> it's literally like we're, it's like nothing outside of our classroom. It's completely just us giving these tests and sometimes giving them over and over until the kid got the right grade. And so I just knew a lot of teachers that would make them up. And there was these um, maybe like twice a year tests that were given. And these are kind of like the big ones, but still we were in charge of administering. Benchmarks. Yeah, grading them, entering them and our actual like state level assessment, like for the teachers, our evaluation was tied into this test score. So I was talking to a teacher and she's just like, oh yeah, like I just fixed those scores so I could get the right percentage. Because literally like if these kids, if teachers reported honestly, a lot of the times that, you know, most of the kids failed the test, essentially they would get put in from like a, a category like highly effective, maybe down to like satisfactory or needs improvement. And so I, it was my opinion that a lot of people were cheating. A lot of people were making up stuff. It was the same exact thing with Teach for America. Um, we wanted to be able to show data to like, you know, <laughs> impress the people that were given millions of dollars to Teach for America. Like, oh, Teach for America teachers are so special compared to average regular teachers that they can go in and take a kid that's three years behind and get them on grade level in five weeks flat. And we did this by, you know, doing, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the test name, but there's these little tests that, you know, the kid basically basically reads and like circles things and whatever. And so there's an enormous pressure on those TFA teachers to be like, oh, because it's kind of like a the grading's a little subjective on these reading tests where they're reading back to you and back and forth. Right. And so, and you can even select the books that, you know, the kids are going to be tested from. So you could literally think, oh, this text's a little easier. I'm going to give them this one because I know right. they have it. There's just so much fudging that goes on. And again, it like, it benefits the superiors to wink at it because then they can report to their supervisor like, oh, look, my core members, you know, provided an average of two and a half years of growth in five weeks of summer school. So I just think the whole thing is like a sham that's imploding before our eyes. And it's only a matter of time before I think the whole system just collapses. Wow. No, I mean, I, I knew I, I knew things had gotten worse, right? And I had heard some things about, you know, fudging scores and so forth, but I didn't realize, you know, it was kind of, it's kind of an epidemic of it, right? So it's, it's really widespread. And that's, that's scary because I don't think I encountered that in my teaching. I mean, we didn't, we, well, I don't know. I mean, I might've had colleagues that didn't, I didn't realize it, but I don't think so. Um, because there were no huge gains like that, right? Like with, with that would raise a red flag, like, wait a minute, you know, this kid was on a second grade level and then and six weeks later, they're on a fourth grade level. That would, that would definitely be a red flag for me. 
right? Absolutely. So that's that's really sad because then we're not really even getting the results we were claiming. Yeah. And that goes toward the new problem that nobody wants to, you know, hold kids back or fail them or have them repeat a grade. And so even with students, I think they sense on some kind of level, like, I don't really need to know this material. Because <laughs> at least, you know, when I went to school in Texas, you know, in the 90s, I remember our elementary teachers saying, like, you know, if you don't pass these standardized tests, they were called, I think, the map test back then or something, you know, you will not be able to go to the next grade. And it was, I think it was real. But I mean, these days, like kids know they don't really have to pass anything. They don't really have to understand anything. And like, they could fail everything. They could turn in absolutely nothing. Thing for the most part and usually do like some small little maybe the like project. a packet yeah and yeah. just like pass and so I just think like everybody the kids are not as good at, at pretending I think that's where the behavioral problems are coming in at because they're not going in motivated like I need to earn I need to achieve I need to learn something or else I'm not going to get this reward they don't that concept is not even present I think in a lot of schools um, I'm sure other wealthier districts, maybe they might have a more traditional system, but I just know in a lot of Title I schools, it's right. like they've given up trying. Like they're not trying to really get kids on grade level. They're trying to see like, what can we do to make it look like they are? And so, yeah. yeah that's sad. That's sad. And, and, and you know, it, we've fallen such a long ways because when I was in school, like I think back to like my high school experience, it was really pretty straightforward if you were a teacher then. Teachers taught, students learned. I mean, the shenanigans that go on now, never, never. You 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 pull that, you'd be gone for a while. Um, you were, there was no way you were getting in teachers' faces. And there was no way you were going to, like, get around the system by not doing work. You, at my high school, you didn't do the work you're going to fail. Yeah, that reminds me a lot of like immigrant families. A lot of my students from like Nigeria or different places, like their parents were not tolerating foolishness from their kids. Like they were expected to do their work and do their homework and do their projects. And it wasn't even a question. And so I do think that, you know, that definitely goes back to the, the conversation of values, you know, and I think that's a, that's a conversation that is definitely not allowed to be Hell, I know. I felt I felt guilty even just mentioning it. Like, I, oh no, it's real. I, mean, I, I just, I'm always like so paranoid. Honestly. No, it's real. Yeah, it's just I I've brought it up several times gently that it seems like a lot of our families do not value education, <laughs> and there's always an excuse. And so, and as long as there's excuses, the results are going to remain the same. And, and I think, and the way I'm kind of looking at it is, it's like you know, families will sort of respond to the expectations of a school. So if the expectations of a school are really high for kids, a lot of the parents will fall in line. But if they're really low, they'll fall in line with that too. But there's plenty of parents from poverty that know that there's significant problems and they know their kids are not learning and they're upset yeah. about it and their voices are lost in the system. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what saddens me. It's like, you know, they know something's wrong. They may not have the, the, the educational background to put it into the exact words that we're using, but they know their kids are not learning very well, right. you know, and they know something's wrong and they can't seem to get anybody to, to listen to them or, or they get people to listen to them. And then the solutions are the things that we're talking about that don't work. Oh, well, we're going to do this, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, but that doesn't work. None of those systems work. Why, why are we doing systems that don't work? Well, that's what made me so frustrated about the change from the traditional A through F, you know, kind of pass fail system because parents could understand that. But then when we switched over to this odd standards based system that wasn't even being implemented properly, I'll add, <laughs> parents don't know what to do with, okay, so my kid has a W like, okay, but they can take the same test. 10 more times like you know and so the fact that you know regular homework and projects it's not like it was going into a grade book like when we were growing up so it's not like the parents could see okay your kid has like 38 zeros because they haven't done anything <laughs> the only thing zeros. that was being graded and tracked was these ridiculous little benchmark tests which the teachers had motivation to fudge anyway so it's just it's on the level of a conspiracy at this point it's so bad I thought teachers weren't even allowed to record zeros. Well, it's zero getting to that. Yeah, I mean, like in certain states and a lot of, they were trying to talk about that before I left my last district about, you know, the idea of not having zeros and the lowest score you can get is a 50 and just craziness. Um, but they were already doing like standards-based grading anyway. So I wasn't even sure like what the point of the conversation was because it's like, well, we're only tracking benchmarks anyway. So, and it's not like you can get like a 50 
on a benchmark. I don't know. Half the things they did didn't make any sense to me at all. <laughs> so. There's certainly issues with grading that we can talk about. And there's there are things that you can do to improve all that. But again, kind of just throwing it out the window, like the baby with the bathwater kind of mentality. That's not the answer either. I, I swear, American society, if we would just figure out how to be a little more reasonable and in the center rather than on the extremes, be it left or right, like if we would just not do those things <laughs> and then we could come together, we could probably make some intelligent decisions that would benefit all of us, but we don't do that. And the people with the loudest voices are on the extremes of American mm -hmm. society. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And they're the ones who, yeah. And they push the whole agenda and I'm like, this is madness. Like and, and it's infected every sphere of being, including education and education is like, it's so group think now. Nobody wants to go against uh, a lot of the things that I'm saying to you now, I would say at work and people would be like, looking at me like, and I kept telling everybody that, that, that those systems that they were using for uh, elementary curriculums were, were, were not valid. And then the research came out about them that validated what I said. And I was like, I told you, I told you that why didn't you go do your research on them? Right? Like, why do we just accept why? And why do administrators just accept? Oh, this is, this is, oh, this is good. This is awesome. Okay. Look at it deeply. Have your teachers sit down and take apart a curriculum and have honest, open, open, discussions about it not where like people are shut down and i bet you if you'd done that you would have teachers would have told you don't adopt that system yes right i think honestly if teachers were allowed to have more buy-in that would solve so many of these problems but that was like another one of my big pet peeves is that teachers were treated like complete idiots <laughs> i feel like it's one of the only professions where like the average person has a master's degree and they're treated as if they don't understand or know anything oh i know I know. Yeah. I mean, it's really demeaning. Really. I was never treated that way as a teacher. Can't even imagine being treated that way. I would have been so dispirited. You know, I was working with a teacher one time that told me something that I thought was really kind of profound. She said, look, Gary, I can be at a school where I have to fight kids all day, but my administration has my back. Or I can be at a school where I have really awesome kids, but the administration is just horrible. But I cannot be at a school where I am smashed between kids who won't behave and do their work and an administration that doesn't know what it's doing and is degrading to teachers. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, you're right. You're caught between these two forces. You're going to be worn down because there's no one to pick you up, right? At least if you have one of them, you can keep going. Oh, I'm doing this because my kids are so awesome. This is great. Oh, I'm doing this because even though the, I'm struggling with the kids, I have support so I, I can keep going. Okay. I'm just getting battered around from both sides. That and that's so not even weird. mentioning where parents come in. Parents. But, <laughs> yeah. In the community. Right, the, the trifecta, right? The, tri the, the trifecta. Now, now you're getting battered from three different angles. I don't know why any teacher would ever even stay in this. And, and I mean, I think the average when I was in was about five years teachers would quit. I'm thinking it's sooner now. I'm thinking it's more like two or three years. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, you don't even get good at teaching until after about three years. That's when you get your sea legs. About, the, about your third year, you start really feeling your oats and you start kind of putting a system together that works for you. And then you start perfecting that system and getting better and better at it. So if you drop out after your second you know, year, that means that kids are only getting first and second year teachers. You don't know what you're doing your first and second year. Oh, I, I didn't anyway. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah, I struggled. You know, my third year is like, it sort of all came together for me, but I'm not saying it was perfect. I mean, if we, if we have teachers that constantly quit after two years, you're going to start seeing students graduate with more gaps. I mean, these kids right now, because of COVID, I, 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 it's almost like another lost generation, in my opinion. Yeah. It, we're, we're really behind the curve, now. really, really behind the curve. And I think it's, I think it's like you said, I think the only way we're going to have a reset is a total collapse first. And I'm not advocating for a collapse. <laughs> I'm saying I don't know how else we can like look at it and rebuild this thing. They've got to start letting teachers give their opinion on things. Mm -hmm. um, and I know some teachers that had really lousy opinions about things. Okay, I get that. But I knew some teachers had really intelligent things to say. And they were, you know, and in my school, at least to the degree they were listened to. I don't think that's the case for teachers anymore. I think teachers are like, the administration is kind of like, just shut up and kind of do it. Mm -hmm. Don't question it. We want kids to be critical thinkers. Well, I was critically thinking about that. But did we ask you for anything? We want the kids to be critical thinkers, not you. <laughs> That's so right. true. Yeah, I actually have had at least two administrators make the comment, if you don't like how things are done here, there's the door. Like, 
honest to goodness, two different administrators said that. So I think it's really clear in education that, you know, if you kind of like stick your head out, you're going to be the first one to get bonked on the head. So, well, we'll close with a, with a philosophical question. <laughs> Not really. The question is, if you could change one thing in education, you had a magic wand and you could just change one thing, what would it be? <laughs> okay, so I, I'm not going to even be all that philosophical about this. I'm going to be really practical. And, and this, there's one thing I, I could say could be implemented that might change things a little bit. And, and, and it's the idea of the reciprocity principle. So the reciprocity principle says, whatever I ask of teachers, my A, B, C, D, or one, two, three, four, whatever I ask, I as an administrator and as a district have to do parallel things to enable those things to happen. If I ask you to do all these things, if I ask you to do these five things, whatever those things may be, I now have to do five things that make it fairly easy for you to be able to do all those things. Because if not, I shouldn't be asking you to do it. If I'm not going to take a parallel or reciprocal approach as a leader to enable you to do the things that I want you to do, if I'm not going to do the things to help you do those things, then it's pointless for me to ask you. So if you, in, if you introduce this idea of reciprocity, that would change a lot because now as an administrator, no, I want you to do this, this. Okay, that means I need you to do that. Well, I don't have time to do that. Exactly. Right? Like that would sort of, that. I think that that might actually get people to start thinking about all the things that they ask everyone to do. Because then it would become readily apparent that they don't have priorities. And that's to me is the biggest thing that's, I, I've seen, I've done like sort of curriculum audits on schools and said, what are you doing here? There's so many things going on. How is it in any world possible for any teacher? I said, I consider myself a very competent teacher. There's no way I can do all this. And you want your teachers. I said, this is an incoherent system. So if you forced reciprocity, that would force their hands of trying to manage those things and actually make sure that they could be done. And they'd soon find out they couldn't. <laughs> And then we can start having a, a conversation about, okay, so what should we do now? I don't know. That might be, that might be kind of a lame answer, Trish. But no, I love yeah. it. That's super creative. That's great. I think it would be really, really effective for sure. That's awesome. Okay, cool. well, I hope somebody hears it and, you know, the idea catches on. <laughs> yeah, and I want to I want to end by saying I'm not like anti-administrator or anything like that. Okay. Like I'm not. And I had very good administrators and I had actually good experiences overall in Texas in my job. And, I, and I'm very grateful for all the things that I've had. I just have concern about where education is going. And I, I just want us to be able to have open and honest conversations without finger pointing and, and labels. I just I don't know how we move forward when we just label each other. It's, it's sad. It's really sad. And you'll never get to even know another person's point of view if you just label them as this or label them as that. We're not labels. We're individuals. And if we could just honor that, maybe we could have this on, honest conversation. And then I'll end with that. That was fantastic, Gary. Well, thank you okay. so much for being on. I think everybody's really going to enjoy listening to this episode. And you're always welcome back if you think of anything that you want to chat about. So we will see you guys next time. Bye, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Trish. Bye-bye.